Oh, buongiorno Italia. Now, we, we think in terms of trilogies because it sounds like we're more intelligent, more profound, more academic. Um, it does have more relationship to Brazil than I thought when we began the project, uh, because Brazil really was looking at 1984 when we made it. And this has ended up, because it's grown since the, we began, and, and seems to be very much about the time we're living in now, the future seemed to have come and caught us before we caught the future. Futures are now running backwards, I think. And uh, so I think it's about life now, how we work with the, the connected world, the web, how we, do we have real relationships anymore? Or do we only have virtual relationships? Uh, these are the things that it seems to be about. Also, some good jokes in it as well. I don't think he's an idealist. I think he's a man who life got the better of. And he's isolated himself from the world. And he just does his job like most of us do. People who work in corporations are very much like Cohen. Do they question what they're doing or do they just do the job? And uh, it seems more and more as the corporate world consumes us, People are frightened of asking questions. People are frightened of losing their jobs. So there's something of that in the film. Um, there's just all these different strands that I'm still trying to work out what it is we did. Uh, when I work it out, I'll let you know. Maybe you'll get there before I do. I just thought, this is the way the world is becoming. I find when I sit in front of my computer in the morning that I become captured by it. I become seduced by it. I'm allowed access to what appears to be all the knowledge of the world. And at the same time, my wife, my wife wonders what has happened to me as a human being. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think it does, from when we've shown it to people, it does seem to resonate with the younger people, the, the people who really are, you know, connected to the internet as much as they are, it becomes to consume, begins to consume your life. Um, and I found they immediately respond to it. They understand who this character is. And I think uh, the more that we're connected to the web, the more we understand him. Vision is just looking at what the world has become. I, I you know, we have access to all of this but yet we're separated. Uh, communities seem to be divided by the financial crisis, by everything. Uh, it's, it's a Damocles sword for everybody in Greece. Uh, that, uh, it's two-edged, it's good and it's bad. I'm not sure, I don't know the answer, I just know it can, it can be dangerous, but it also can be exciting. I like the fact that, uh, you know, Places, I, I mean, I think much of if the, what we used to call the Arab Spring, which now seems to have moved into summer and possibly winter, uh, was possible because of young people being able to communicate as they do with the web. And that's fantastic. But then I wonder how many of them are there since we now we see the exact same people that were running Egypt back in control. So. I, I don't know, I worry, and I think if I can make a film that gets us talking, discussing, thinking, arguing, then that's a step towards you know, a better solution to whatever, whatever problems we're, we're, we're dealing with. And, uh, and I do, I think, I find it interesting that how many relationships are virtual now on the web. People hide behind uh, false names, they communicate. It may be the only way a lot of them younger people can actually communicate now because we're presented with a world in advertising and on television of the gods and goddesses, the beautiful, the perfect, and we're not like that. Most of us are, don't look like that. So how do you communicate uh, with others if you think they're expecting you to be a god or a goddess? So you do it in secret. Um, I don't know, it's all of those things. I worry a lot, and then I luckily get to make a film and stop worrying for about a, about a year until we get the film done, then I start worrying again. What was interesting is we had so little time from the moment we 
Well, Jenny Casarado, my agent, said, what if we call Nicholas Chartier about uh, Zero Theorem? And that was basically the end of May or the beginning of June. And by October, we were shooting the film. So everything had to be done by instinct. We didn't spend a lot of time. I mean, and when I saw Melanie's tape, I said, oh, fantastic. And I think the only suggestion I gave you was think of Marilyn Monroe and Judy Halliday and see if you can combine them in some way. But, and that's, that's basically how we worked. We worked very fast by getting the right people and then relying on their, you know, their character, their brilliance, whatever. I mean, I mean, David I'd wanted to work with for years. It was the same thing. Ah, David, you're free? Let's go. <laughs> and so things were very quick. Oh, the role of love is such a dangerous thing in society. <laughs> oh, my God. It's... And that's what our dear Cohen is frightened of. It's clear he had a life before. It's clear he had women he was in love and he had been damaged in the course of this. And so he's hiding from it all. And he's resisting Bainsley with every sinew of his body. And, and strangely enough, she seduces him in a virtual world and then disappoints him in the real world. And then he's unable to... Let's complete the relationship in the real world. It's very, it's actually very tragic uh, and very sad, but uh, that's what love can do to you. Uh, it's a dangerous thing. I don't, I don't recommend it at all. <laughs> <laughs> to me, the, the, the safe way of looking at the future is by looking to the past. And so that's how I work. We mix the two things. One level, technology is reached a certain stage, but it, as that swings up, other things start collapsing. So, you know, we start with a burnt out chapel. Uh, I mean, simple sim symbology, you know, basically religion. Is, does it work anymore? Do the old faiths mean anything? Is our new faith technology? So you start with that. Dave Warren, who worked with me on, on Dr. Parnassus, I brought him in, and, and Dave was absolutely extraordinary. And, we shot in Bucharest because it was cheaper than shooting in London and probably in Italy, unfortunately. Um, and, and we had a great, a great crew there. And we were able to make things for a fraction of the price we would, say, in London. And uh, Dave and, and the art department, the construction department, just did an extraordinary job. So there's not much. I mean. The only technological leap is, just to make it interesting, I thought we'd have liquid memory, but it's, by the time we had finished the film, it was already, people are talking about using DNA as memory. So the future, we are living in it. It may, in fact, we may have missed it. It maybe, maybe happened a few years ago, and we're now in some decline. Um, but, and then Carlo Poggioli, who did the costumes, who had worked with me on Brothers Grimm and with Gabriele Piscucci before and on, on Baron Munchausen, Carlo went to work. And again, we were working with very small amounts of money and he had to dress a lot of people. So what did he do? He started looking for cheap fabric. And the first thing, let's get some uh, transparent plastic tablecloths, small shower curtains, we'll work with that. And then we found a Chinese market outside of Bucharest, or uh, Carlo did, where you could buy fabric, not by the yard or the meter, you bought it by the kilo, by weight. It was horrible stuff, but it was cheap. And anybody who had to wear it, as Matt Damon did, understood just how horrible, horrible it was. You sweated like a pig inside of it, but it looks great on film. So it was really teaming with a very small number of people who were incredibly talented, working under very, a lot of pressure of time and money, and out of that squeezes out, explodes what you see on the screen. It's, much of it is what we had or what we could get our hands on, other things were what we wanted. So it wasn't the kind of movie that you see if you see, I mean, beautiful movies, say like Pacific Rim, where every inch of it has been designed, built. We were basically in the real world trying to make a surreal, futuristic movie. So it's, it's that dynamic that's both exciting, infuriating, and surprising by the end result. Uh, as far as the great uh, X of all the things you can't do in the park, uh, I was in Antwerp uh, working on an opera, and they have in Antwerp at the beginning of this uh, pedestrian precinct a giant heart in the shape. It's a big 
heart-shaped thing with, again, all the no, no, no things on it. So we stole from Antwerp. I hope they will forgive us. <laughs> but it's completely different. Ours is an X, which you could, is about no. It could be just a big bandage as well. This is what you put this bandage on the world saying, don't do any things. You'll be safer. Bullshit. Well, and that was the great thing about Bucharest. I've got to say this. Because there was no health and safety there. There was freedom in Bucharest. <laughs> People had to take responsibility for their own lives. People were great. We had energy again. We weren't oppressed, depressed, uh, all the pressings that uh, all those concerned ministries have for our lives to make us safe. Sorry. I'm not going to give you my version of the re end. I want everybody to have their own version. I want you to go to dinner tonight and all argue about what it really means. I want to leave you with questions, not simple little answers. No, no, you've got to have to think about this film. On the, what the one thing I do know at the end, he's looking dignified, he's looking strong, and he is in control of that world, whatever it might be, virtual or not, because he allows the sun to set. And that, to me, was what was important. Can we take control of whatever little bit of reality or virtuality or surreality that our lives may be? That's how... Oh, I wasn't supposed to tell you that. Sorry. I, <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit! <laughs> <laughs>